Hello everyone, thanks for joining me today. My name is James Roach. I'm the Head of Creative um, and Content at Crowd. Uh, I want to take you through uh, my Creative Link Building 101 deck today, which will just show you how we go about obtaining links through the use of creative assets and digital PR. So today we'll cover what is Creative Link Building, the key phases that are involved, the expected results and KPIs that you might see from this type of activity, and lastly I'll take you through some case studies as well. So starting with what is creative link building? Creative link building um, for us at Crowd is the outreach of a creative asset uh, to high DA news publications. And it's typically for the purpose of them trying to feature that piece of content, linking back to the asset itself or to a selected page from the client's website. Creative assets come in all forms. So sometimes we can make um, interactive uh, assets, static data visualizations, games and puzzles or tools as well. And this is some stuff we've done in the past just to show you what it looks like when it is featured by a news publication. So this is a piece I did for Traveloka regarding the 50 cheapest Michelin meals, which was uh, including, included on Business Insider uh, and a piece that was featured on Thrillist um, called America's Quietest Roots, which we did for a, a company called Geotab. So the key phases involved in this kind of work are um, it's usually five key phases involved. So we normally start with the ideation phase, which is the process of generating ideas uh, through brainstorming and through validation with working journalists. We've also got the research phase, um, which comes after the ideation where we basically gather all the data that we need to produce the asset. Then there's obviously the design phase, which is uh, where we bring all the, the research and the data together and try and show that in a way that will um, be visually effective to the user. Um, and not always involved, but if we are making something that's interactive, then there will obviously be a development stage involved where we bring the design to life. Uh, and very importantly at the end here is the PR and outreach, um, which is where we uh, essentially um, try and drive results for the asset that we've created by pushing it out to different news publications online. So I'll talk through each of these phases in a bit more detail, starting with ideation. Um, so when we look at ideation, we, obviously um, there are different types of ideas that work for this purpose. Uh, and when we're thinking about the ideas and ideating for ideas, um, two things that we try to keep in mind is um, everything we come up with needs to be newsworthy first of all. So we've got to remember that we're reaching out to journalists who work for news publications. So what we create has to have a newsworthy hook so that they will cover it. Um, but the idea also has to have some kind of brand relevance so that your brand um, is uh, in a position to be talking about this particular subject and it doesn't, doesn't uh, seem alien to, to people who see this. Um, at the same time, when we talk about brand relevance, uh, we don't want the actual piece of content that we create to actually talk about a product or a service that a particular brand offers because that does detract um, for, for journalists when they want to feature this kind of content. So it's about trying to find that sweet spot in the middle there or something that is newsworthy and has brand relevance. Um, so when we do uh, start our ideation, there is a book actually that I should mention, sorry. Um, yes, so there was a book by two chaps called Chip and Dan Heath who um, created this book called Made to Stick, which is literally about why some ideas take hold and others come unstuck. And it's something that we used as a basis of our ideation. Um, it talks about six key factors that make an idea stick, which um, we've used as a, as a basis for, for coming up with ideas. One, the first one being um, make sure that your idea is simple. So it's essentially about not burying the lead making sure that the, the key idea and the key story is uh, front and center. Number two is making sure that what you're, what you're making uh, or what you're uh, showing people is unexpected. So what is new or different about what you're presenting to people? Uh, number three is make it concrete. Uh, and a good example they use in the book here is about, um, you know, you can't pick up a calorie, but you can pick up a burger. So it's about the use of language and how you really tell the story you're telling uh, and making it relatable. Uh, number four is credible. So is your piece credible? So the data that you're using, is it coming from a credible source? Is it um, government data, for example, or is it credible data that's coming from yourselves? Number five, emotional. Um, so does your content make people feel something? 
And number six, lastly, like I mentioned earlier, the story. So people do remember stories and not stats. Obviously, a lot of the content we make is built up from statistics, but the statistics tell a story and that's what we need to get across. So the ideation process isn't just a brainstorm. Um, it's a process with multiple review points that make sure that we keep on brief and deliver the best ideas. So our ideation process looks like this. Step one is essentially the preparation uh, and the creative brief stage. Um, so what we'll do here is work with the client um, to get an understanding of exactly what it is we want this content to achieve, making sure that we're all aligned on that. Um, finding out who the target audience is and uh, target publications that we want to be featured in and to understand the kind of topics that the client is comfortable talking about uh, and write off any ones that they're uncomfortable talking about. Step two is the researching of the landscape phase. So uh, we'll look at the client's target audience uh, and the content that they consume. We'll look at what target publications are actually writing about currently. We'll look at the content that's already out there on said subject matters, and we'll look at potential um, compelling visual execution as well that we might want to use. So the outcome of this stage is uh, hopefully a well-rounded understanding of uh, our client and their audience, some raw ideas, and some inspiring, inspiring executions as well. Step three is the refinement phase. So at this point, we'll start to flesh out any raw ideas that we do have, get initial validation from our team, and identify any non-ideas of the one, two, three meeting. So a one, two, three meeting is essentially where um, everyone involved in the ideation comes together and pitches their ideas that they have um, to the team. And we'll all grade those, um, those ideas with a one, two or a three. One being an idea that we really think is, is good, two being something that's okay, and three being an idea that we think is just not gonna work. So that allows us to, to get rid of a lot of ideas that we don't think are, are really up to scratch. So step four is the evaluation phase. So um, this is where we'll basically um, take our ideas from step three, talk to some working journalists and some PR specialists uh, and tweak the idea accordingly so we can make sure we, go to, we come up with something that really is going to work for press. So phase two is the research and data phase. So there are varying ways in which you can actually gather data and, uh, and research for a creative asset. You can actually produce your own survey, go out to a select number of people um, and ask them questions that you, uh, that you really want to find uh, answers to. You can use your own client data that you may have, which is uh, usually the preferred option because it's, the, it's data that only you will have. So it can offer some sort of truly unique insights. Uh, and then, of course, there are government or council issued data and, report, and reports. So stuff like ONS reports, which is freely available um, and is a really good, credible source of data. Uh, and of course, there's website and social media scraping. So a number of websites such as TripAdvisor, for example, uh, or forums like Reddit can be really good places to mine for data. So phase, phase three and four is a design and development stage. Obviously, with everything we create these days, it has to, we have to think about being mobile and responsive first. So really, with design, you don't want to go ahead and create uh, an asset which, if you are going to make interactive, um, might, true, uh, might prove to be quite tricky to, to actually convert into something that's interactive. So we always work very collaboratively with the developer. Uh, when we start the design stage, making sure that what we do create from a design perspective is going to work when they come to develop it. So like I mentioned, um, we always design mobile first. So um, a good thing to think about in this instance is sometimes a lot of these interactives may be a map, for example, which are, um, can prove to be quite tricky to navigate on a mobile phone screen. Um, so we always need to think about that kind of stuff. Um, and how it's going to work when it um, scales down to a mobile handset. Um, we need to keep the design simple, not just for development, but also just so that we actually get the story across to people in the correct way. And people don't have to dig around too far or too long to see what we're trying to show them as the, the key story. And also a note on branding. So with these kind of um, assets, we have found that the best way to, to actually approach them is to have as little branding as possible because um, if a piece is too heavily branded, 
journalists tend to not want to actually feature the piece because it looks too much like an advert. Um, so we do try to keep the branding uh, as minimal as possible. Uh, phase five is outreach and PR. So this is obviously a very important stage um, of the process because uh, along with a good idea, um, obviously you do have to have uh, a great design and if you are making something interactive, something that is really nice and usable for the user, but it's no good having all of that stuff if you don't outreach and, and PR it correctly to the right people. So um, our PR um, team, basically work hard to unearth the stories and the headlines within the data and the piece that we've created. So they'll look through all the gathered data, put out the most important and newsworthy elements that they think will work with press. Um, and these will obviously de uh, differ depending on the kind of press we're going to. So the kind of headlines that we might pull out for mainstream press may differ from uh, business press, for example. The PR team will also create prospect lists. So this is the case of literally going through and finding the, the relevant journalists um, and publications that we should reach out to with our asset. So we typically make a prospect list of around 200 to 300 working journalists. Uh, and we can use tools such as Gorkana to, to gather all their contact details so that we can reach out to them. Our PR team will also create press releases. So um, a press release is something that will uh, cover all of the main headlines and stories from the, the asset that we've created. And then they actually start to manually outreach the journalists and publications um, using tailored emails, depending on the journalist, what they've written before, um, what kind of publication they work for. In those emails, we'll also have a link to the asset that we're trying to push, uh, as well as a link to a Dropbox folder, which will contain the press release that we created, as well as any supplementary assets, such as imagery, um, that sometimes journalists like to use to actually embed on their page. And yes, the reason we use a Dropbox link for that purpose is because this avoids uh, any of our emails getting caught in their spam filters and things like that, uh, and making the emails too large as well. Our PR team uh, are responsible for the reporting on um, the success and any links that we actually um, manage, to, manage to gain from our outreach process. So expected results and KPIs. So one thing to, to note for this kind of activity is that we can't actually guarantee the number of links or placements that we're going to get. However, we do have a scale that we, we work to, which we see, um, which we use as a gauge for success, essentially. So 10 to 15 links is something that we see as being an acceptable campaign, right up to 50 plus links being something that we see as outstanding. Also worth noting is that um, the amount of money that you spend on a campaign in terms of um, development or um, whether it's an interactive or a static doesn't always necessarily correlate with more links. However, what we have found over, our, um, over a few years of, of doing this, this kind of work is that something that is interactive um, and has a really great sort of um, execution combined with a really good idea does and will perform better than something which is, is static. Link building campaigns are not intended to drive sales or signups directly for a product. So you probably won't see a direct correlation or an uptick in sales after one of these kind of campaigns. Um, what these campaigns are actually created for uh, is, is to help increase the DA ranking of a client site, which in turn will help increase the flow of organic traffic, which will obviously, uh, as a result, you may start to see um, you know, uptick in sales because you're actually driving more traffic to your site. We typically don't start to see results like that until after about three months after the, the a campaign launch. So moving on to some case studies. This is a, this is a campaign that I did for a company called Geotab um, and something that I would class as a, a large scale interactive. Um, Geotab are a company that we probably wouldn't know over here very well, but they are basically a fleet tracking company in Canada. So they basically make um, a, a little black box that goes into a truck and will track the amounts, the, the, the mileage of a, of a truck uh, across its routes uh, across America when it's delivering goods. So we created a link building campaign for them around uh, America's quietest routes. And this was basically gathering um, readily available data on uh, traffic data for highways in America 
And what we did was we were able to uh, ascertain which were the, the quietest routes in America. So we could find out the quietest highway in, in every single state of America, as well as obviously crown what the, the, uh, the quietest route in the whole of the US was as well. So this gave us the opportunity to go out to uh, local press in every single state of America, as well as to national press as well in the US. And what we did as an extra layer on top of that was kind of romanticized it and coupled that data with the whole road trip of America that everyone um, is uh, familiar with. And so the final piece had some really beautiful imagery. We also um, signed up with the, signed up a, an, an Instagram influencer to help with some imagery and to give a, a top 10 list of some of the places that we featured, which are best for road trips um, and that kind of thing. So uh, we managed to get uh, an actual 220 referring domains when we launched this and went out to press. And over a year, we did seven campaigns for Geotab, which actually um, helped increase their DA from 44 or right up to 51. Another piece we did uh, was for a company called Traveloka, and this is something that I would class as a, a small interactive. So this was a piece looking at the cheapest Michelin meals around the world. So using the Michelin, Michelin website, we were actually to, uh, able to scrape the data from there um, for uh, the actual cost of, of meals in Michelin star restaurants around the world. And literally what we did was just gather this data uh, and sort it in such a way so we could find out where the uh, the cheapest Michelin meals were actually, uh, um, where they were actually around the world and from which restaurants. So we produced um, a small scale interactive. It didn't warrant anything too big because the date that what we were trying to show was quite simple. Uh, and it was literally a sortable table where we found out that literally the, the cheapest Michelin meal in the world was in Singapore and was $2.20. So, you know, immediately that gave us a hook to go to press with because, you know, uh, most people assume that Michelin meals and Michelin restaurants are something that isn't really open to, to everybody because they're so expensive. When we launched this, we managed to get over 120 linking root domains and we produced four pieces of content for this particular client over the space of a year. Uh, which assisted in increasing the DA of their main site uh, by five. Uh, another case study we've got here is something again that I would class as a small scale interactive for, for Right Move, which I'm sure most of us uh, are aware of. So this was something that we did um, just this year actually, and it managed to, to get 20 referring domains. What we did was we got in touch with over 100 builders and trade traders over uh, in the UK and found out how much it would cost on average to add an extension to your home, whether it be a small, medium or a large one. And we, we basically got in touch with, with builders all around the country so that we could actually plot them in the back end of this so that you could put in your postcode uh, and work out on average how much it would cost to actually put an extension on your home and obviously work out what the increase in your property value would be as a result. So yes, this was, um, there was a lot of data that we had to pull together, a lot of manual work in putting that together. Execution wise was quite simple, quite small, because it didn't really need to be um, anything too, too big to show that story. But the overall message was, was, um, was received quite well and we got 20 referring domains from, from press. Uh, and lastly, we did a piece for Go Compare, which was called What Powers the World? And this was looking at different fuel sources that different countries around the world actually use. So we created this interactive map where you could click on or click off fossil fuels, nuclear fuel or renewables. And um, depending on which parts of the world highlighted, it would show you which, which countries in the world use those actual sources of energy. And this got over 50 referring domains. And something that we weren't expecting was that actually, actually near National Geographic actually uh, included it on their educational blog, which was um, something that we were quite proud of, to be fair, but and wasn't fully expecting at all. So that brings us to the end of the presentation. Hopefully you found some useful information in there. My name is James Roach. I'm, like I said, mentioned earlier, I'm the head of content and creative at Crowd. If you want to get in contact with me to discuss anything that you've seen in here, um, you can get me on james.roach at crowd.com. Thank you very much.